director of state advocacy at the National Alliance of Charter Schools. She's going to get into some more of the nuts and bolts about charters that uh, we heard about uh, just a second ago. Previously, uh, Lisa was a high school Spanish teacher in the LA School District um, and has also taught as far away as uh, China, and Mexico, and Ecuador. So, uh, with that, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And I um, just want to echo, feel free to grab some coffee, use the restroom, whatever it is. Um, so, so the PowerPoint will just take care of as we move along. Um, just a little bit about myself. I came to the Charter School Movement 10 years ago, and I was just supposed to edit a charter <coughs> application. Um, I'm based out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I am the uh, uh, one of the primary founders of the first rural charter school in New Mexico in the northern part of the state up near Taos. And we just celebrated our 10 year anniversary. Anniversary. We, we create a whole lot of ripples in the state by actually establishing a, a charter school, one of the most rural, isolated areas in the state. But I'm proud to say now that it is the only charter school in the state nationally ranked. Um, we have uh, consistently for the last four years been cited as one of the 500 best high schools by Newsweek, by Newsweek magazine and the Washington Post Challenge Index. We have consistently been rated as one of the top high schools preparing students for college uh, via um, advanced placement uh, courses. So I'm very proud of that. And I stand here today to tell you that with lots of focus, as Eric said, with a lot of political will, will through state policymakers and your governor's office, truly um, the face of education can change in every single state. So with that, I think I'll start. I'll just move forward. Do I control this? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so what are public charter schools? I won't read this verbatim, but I do want to ask a question. How many in the room here are parents? How many folks have children? So we could probably say 98% of the people in the room have children. Um, how many, how many of you have more than one child? Okay. And how many um, of us in this room treat those children the exact same way? I'm saying I know discipline and structure are the same. How many parents treat each child the same? Yes, I'm a parent of two, and what works for my son absolutely does not work for my daughter. Um, and so really, that's just um, a little example that we as parents, um, with the greatest investment we have, which is our children, we know instinctively that what works for one, one of our uh, children may not necessarily work for the next. And really, that's the idea behind charter schools. Again, if we as parents understand that we just need to adjust how we teach our children, why do we continue to expect that every school continue to treat every student in the exact same way? And so the idea behind charter schools, once again, uh, we're public schools, uh, we must have open enrollment, we cannot charge tuition, but again, um, whoops, let's see. But again, um, charter schools essentially are um, schools organized around a specific educational mission. Um, here are some of the traits unique to all charter schools throughout the state. A um, little bit of facts, which I'll get to, but 41 states have charter school legislation, as well as the District of Columbia. And so more and more states are recognizing that if we can infuse our public school system Back, we can reinfuse our public school system with some of these traits. Essentially, we will stop this or, or thwart the idea that, again, public schools are meant to be uniform and to treat every child the same, despite differences that we, as citizens and parents, know exist between each child. Um, so again, the basis of a strong charter school law would incorporate these five traits. I'll get, a, I'll get into a little bit more on the fle flexibility, accountability um, um, traits as we, as we move along here. 
So here's just a real brief history of charter schools. Um, we will be celebrating our uh, anniversary here, uh, one of our main uh, anniversaries here in Minnesota, which was the first state to pass a charter school law in 1991. Um, again, 41 states. Uh, Maine was our success this year. After about four years, we finally were able to enact a charter school law in Maine. Um, other states that do not have laws that the Alliance is working very closely in is Montana. We want to do a lot of things in Kentucky this year. And of course, Mississippi and Alabama as well are, are the four states we're going to be very active in and trying to enact charter school legislation. The last two bullet points are interesting, I believe. Um, due to the federal government's uh, focus on school choice, Due to movies like Waiting for Superman, and uh, even down, even like with Oprah Winfrey's focus on on charter schools, what we have seen in the last few years is this unprecedented focus and interest in charter schools. And those of us like myself who've been in the movement for ten years, it's just been a long time coming, you know, from my perspective anyway. But what we're seeing across the country is that more and more states are enacting, as we saw in Maine this year, more and more states are looking at enacting a charter school law, but more commonly is more and more states are refining and improving their charter school law. Again, there's been a lot of focus down from the federal uh, government, the Secretary of Education, and, and then all the way to Oprah Winfrey, but I think there's been this growing recognition that most charter school laws were passed in the 90s the earlier mid-1990s. And we've learned a whole lot about charter schools in the last 10 years, which is again, I think state policymakers are looking at the best practices and the things we have learned from the charter school movement and taking those lessons and enacting improvements. And so this year, Indiana, New Mexico, Illinois, South Carolina, Texas, and North Carolina, yes, have all significantly, significantly improved their laws and in 2012, these are the states that we're looking to, um, that we are looking to see uh, dramatic improvements in their charter school legislation. And so these states would be added to the 10 states that already have very strong laws, states like uh, Florida, Minnesota, Colorado, for example. And so between the states that have strong laws and the states that have or will improve charter school laws, what we are expecting to happen in 2012 is approximately 20 to 25 states making significant revisions to their law. Um, as we move forward with the presentation, I will go into suggestions as, um, as far as how Kansas can begin to improve their charter school law. We're going to be talking specifically about Kansas in just a few minutes. But again, more and more states are recognizing that it's time to enact improvements. One of the salient features of charter schools is that they are schools that really are formed from the bottom up. Increasingly, um, study or poll after poll show that once parents really understand what a charter school is and how it works, they are overwhelmingly in support of having more charter schools in any jurisdiction. Um, so these are state, excuse me, these are numbers across the country. Um, each year we see significant, uh, significantly more charter schools open around the country. Um, this past year we saw four to five hundred new charter schools open. Um, we're adding upwards of um, 150,000 to 200,000 seats each year in a charter school. And again, um, parental demand for charter schools only increases. So we estimate that there are 400,000 students on the waiting list to enroll in a charter school across the country. A little bit closer to at least my home state, um, we have 290,000 students in the state of New Mexico, public school students, and we estimate 12,000 of those students are on the waiting list to enroll in a charter school in New Mexico. So again, as charter schools receive more recognition for what they're accomplishing and what they really um, can offer parents and families. 
we just see their need, the need for more quality charter schools to increase. Um, again, uh, a, a quick snapshot of the charter school population across the country. Um, largely what we see in most states, certainly across the country, is that charter schools are serving um, a higher percentage of minority students um, and a higher percentage of kids eligible for free and reduced lunch. Part of these, uh, part of these statistics or data points would be explained by, and we can get into this a little bit, is that in states with very robust charter school laws, for example, Florida, Arizona, Minnesota, again, um, Michigan, New York, uh, many of these charters are located in urban areas. And so I think part of these data points are explained by simply in our largest state with the largest percentage of charter school enrollment, many of those um, students are located in urban areas. And so again, like we just went over this, who are our charter schools serving? I think a uh, data point again that will, uh, would, be, would be pertinent to the state of Kansas. Um, we do see 55% located in large cities, 16% um, are located in rural areas, and then here you have the comparison with our traditional uh, public schools population. So again, sort of flip-flopping. Um, the amount, the, the number of charter schools in cities versus the number of charter schools in, excuse me, versus the, num the percentage of traditional public schools located in large cities. So we're going to get a little bit into the performance and research on charter schools, and as Eric had said previously, um, charter schools there's always a lot of focus on how are we performing, how many students you know, are we enrolling, on and on and on. We actually consider that a very good thing. Um, one of the uh, positive, um, one of the positive outcomes, I believe, of charter schools is that real, they really have infused, re-infused the public education system with the notion of what do we expect, what can we expect from our public schools. How are, how are our public schools performing? If you're in Kansas, you're spending 52% of your state budget, is that correct? 52% of the state budget on public education. I think, one of, I think again, one of, the, um, one of the very positive outcomes of charter schools is that there's been more focus on what is the cost benefit of our public, of our public education system and the money we are investing. Um, Okay, never mind, I think I may have missed a slide, but let's get a little bit into charter school performance. So how are charters doing? Um, in the last three to four years, I mean, keep in mind that most, in most states, charter school legislation is about 10 years old. Um, again, most states enacted charter school legislation, or at least legislation that truly permitted autonomous stand-alone stand schools in the uh, late 90s. And so really, the body of research emerging from charter schools is, has really been more robust in the last three to four years. But again, keeping in mind that the charter school movement is relatively young when we look at the public education system we have in place right now. Um, but going back to the first slide, um, to the salient traits of charter schools, um, the real promise of charter schools is more autonomy in exchange for greater accountability. Um, so how, what does that look like on the ground level? And more important, what does that look like when we look at charter school legislation state by state? Essentially, and one of the things that is most lacking in your law here in Kansas is the idea of a performance contract. And so we look at charter school accountability in the sense of every five years, a charter school is reviewed for its performance. And so you receive a charter, and um, every five years, you go before your authorizer, and you, you ask for renewal. 
So the accountability model of charter schools I referenced a few minutes ago really does come from the bottom up. So accountability in the charter school world, first and foremost, are parents choosing to send their, to send their student to a charter school. If a charter school does not, um, it does not you know, maintain a certain student enrollment, it can't make its budget, and therefore the charter school could be closed. So again, that, that bottom up accountability. Um, the, second, uh, the second feature of charter school accountability, again, is this five-year contract. So at, at its very best, a charter school law would say, we're going to give you a charter for five years, and on an annual basis, we're going to measure whether or not you are delivering outcomes for kids and their families. Again, a very different model than what we see in our traditional public schools, which is you essentially just get to stay open, even though you may have low graduation rates, your achievement gap is, is not improving, on and on and on, you just simply get to stay open. It's a very different idea with a charter school law, is that you must prove your value, and you must prove to the taxpayer that you are worth public tax dollar investments in order to stay open. So again, that's the two most salient features of the charter school accountability model. What we would ultimately like to see at the Alliance is all, is all public schools um, operate with that high level of accountability, first to the parents and, and families they serve, and then second to the taxpayers within any jurisdiction. Um, and so again, I put the second bullet point in, uh, you know, I thought of taking it out in the sense of are we editorializing here, but again, because of the, because of the different the different set of accountability that charter schools bring to public education, um, charter schools really are, are holding out that promise that it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter as much as we may think it does, the backgrounds of students, the, the socioeconomic level of students, the color of the student's skin. Because if we're really going to set out to educate kids, and if we're really going to set out to make a wise use of public taxpayer dollars, okay, we should be delivering outcomes for students no matter what or pay some sort of consequence to that. And, and so I think that idea is perhaps one of the, I think is one of the guiding reform tenets uh, that our job as citizens of this country is to educate kids no matter what. No matter where they come from, no matter what set of challenges they bring, our job is to deliver high outcomes for kids. But to keep doing that. Sorry about that. Here we go. So how are charter schools um, doing? Um, in 2008, um, it's, it's considered the most robust uh, uh, piece of research we've seen on charter schools to date. Um, and it really just, it, it really shows that when you compare an apple to apple analysis, when you compare apples to apples, so a child in a charter school that may perhaps be um, Caucasian special education, you compare that student in a charter school, that exact same student with the same characteristics in a traditional school. So that is the type of research methodology we would like to see. Um, the most solid type of research is actually also adding to that, you would actually look at a, a student who was, who, who is enrolled in a charter school versus a student in a traditional school that wanted to enroll in a charter school but because of lottery requirements was not able to, to um, attend. And so again, um, looking at charter school research, we must be very careful that it is an apples to apples comparison. What we see at most state level, what we see in most state level um, research studies is that they simply want to compare the performance of a charter school with its neighboring traditional school. So a mid-school charter school, they want to compare that performance with the local mid-school and the traditional school system. Again, it's a very weak comparison, simply because, again, charter schools are such uniquely defined schools. So that simple comparison, charter versus traditional, um, and I think across the country we're starting to see that it's almost, a, it's a very simplistic way of looking at um, charter school performance. So again, um, one of the, one of the, um, one of the outcomes we're seeing with charter schools is, is or one of the um, one of the points of discussion we're seeing um, through charter schools is 
what do performance studies really look like in all of our traditional, excuse me, in all of our schools? So if we have to be so very careful of the methodology used to evaluate charter school performance, why don't we take that same methodology and apply it to all public schools? So again, one of the discussion points that I believe um, is becoming more prevalent as we look at the performance of all public schools in this country and as, as more and more states look at what is the investment of our public taxpayer dollars in our public schools and are, are we really receiving the types of outcomes that we want to see. So across, you know, in the last couple of years what the Alliance has done and you can find this report on our website is that we take a look at the research done um, year to year on charter schools. And um, the most salient here when we looked at all of the studies is that 21 of these 33 comparative studies show that charter school students are showing larger gains the longer they are, are enrolled in a charter school. And that is one of the significant outcomes of any charter school research study or any charter school performance study we have seen. Uh, what we tend to see is, um, say we have a, an eighth grader having been in the traditional system for seven years and enrolls in a charter school. Uh, again, because charter schools are very different types of, 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 of schools. Um, organizationally on and on, they're just a very different way of approaching education. I'm not good, bad, or different. Charter schools are simply a different way of approaching education. What we see in many of these studies is that first year that student enrolling in a charter school will actually flatline with performance or even decrease a little bit. Um, some of that could be attributed to smaller class size, the idea that because charter schools tend to be charter schools, students cannot fall through the cracks quite so easily as they may in the larger comprehensive school. So what we find in that first year or so, charters, uh, the students' performance would actually decrease slightly. But again, in 21 of the 33 studies conducted, what we see that the longer a student is enrolled in a charter school, the better the performance is simply because of those features of smaller class size, smaller school size, different approach to education, and, and essentially the, the decreasing um, chance that a student in a charter school will fall through the cracks so because of the way the school is organized. Um, again, going back to my home state, what we found with charter school performance exactly mirrored the national studies that after year three, a student enrolled in a charter school, um, the performance just quickly increases, and we have higher graduation rates in our charter schools and higher performance rates in our charter schools the longer a student is enrolled. Um, the Center for um, Research of Educational um, Outcomes uh, out of the Hoover Institute and Stanford University, the Credo study may be the study that we see most reference in national publications. The Credo study was um, accomplished in, in, excuse me, the Credo study was released in 2010. And what this study did of 16 states is show that there are mixed findings for charter schools across the board. Uh, some states, um, according to the Credo study, the charter schools are doing significantly worse than in traditional public schools. Other states, for example, um, Georgia, Minnesota, Colorado, again, states with very strong laws. Uh, Washington, D.C., um, the Credo study found that charter school students were actually outperforming the traditional public schools. Um, the Credo study, again, did that apples to apples, um, apples to apples uh, analysis of taking, again, a student with um, certain characteristics enrolled in a charter school, you know, and looking at the performance of that student over three years, um, um, compared to the, stu uh, the student with the same characteristics, same characteristics in a traditional public school. Um, again, not a surprise to us, um, the, the policy implica implications and policy recommendations from the Credo study was that charter school performance has everything to do with the quality of the charter school law. Charter school performance um, again showed that the long showed that the, the 
longer a charter school student is enrolled in a public school, if the state has a very strong um, charter school law, that those students are indeed outperforming the, their traditional um, public school counterparts. Again, we see these traits, uh, we see these traits again, autonomy, accountability, number of authorizers, and equitable funding, um, again, as very important influences and factors in the success of a state's charter schools program. So let's turn a little bit to the focus of Kansas, which I know is, is why you're all here, and your focus in, um, in looking at school reform, um, school reform possibilities in your state. So again, I've referenced this point uh, several times. In 2009, the National Alliance um, released what we are calling the Model Charter School Law. And the model charter school law serves as the new barometer for high quality public charter school laws throughout the country. So the model charter school law, if you go to our website, you know, uh, National Alliance for Public Charter Schools and put in model charter school law, you can easily access this publication. Um, the model law looked at 20 components of what, in our opinion, constitutes a strong charter school law. We would look at um, caps, growth, authorizing performance, um, clear processes for enrollment, clear processes for approval, for renewal, equitable funding, access to facility funds, um, the level of autonomy given to a charter school, the level of accountability given to a charter school via its charter school law. So there's 20 components of the model charter school law and then what we did is we took, we took the laws of all 41 states, and I'm in the process of doing this now, so it's sort of, it's sort of floating in my head. So we look at the model charter school law, and then we actually every year go to 41 states and analyze their law as com comparing it to the model <coughs> charter school law, and we give that state a score. And so again, here are some of the basic components of what we would consider a strong charter school law. And again, here in Kansas, you have some of these things in place already, um, namely the first and uh, second bullet points. Again, uh, basics of a strong charter school law. So, let's take a look at Kansas and how you rated uh, in, in uh, this past year. Uh, not so good, okay? <laughs> not so good. Um, lots of room for improvement. Again, if you go to the publication Model Charter School Law with the National Alliance, you'll see how we rated the state of Kansas. So you rated 38 out of 41, uh, very much near the bottom of the pack, so to speak. There are possible 280 points and Kansas scored 60. So let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at, um, at how what you can do to uh, improve the law here in Kansas. Um, I referenced this just a few minutes ago. Um, what your law very much needs, and actually one of the reasons for its low score um, on our model Charter School Law 20 components, is that you have very few accountability provisions in your law. We talked a lot, I just referenced um, what it means to, what charter school accountability means, charter school performance contracts, um, transparent application review processes, um, transparent and clear criteria for renewing a charter school, your processes for monitoring your charter schools on a yearly basis, your processes for collecting data and analyzing this data and reporting it out to pertinent legislative committees, the governor's office, etc. Um, essentially, your, your law has none of the quality control um, provisions that we like to see at the National Alliance in a charter school law. Um, again, um, a strong charter school law would focus mostly on outcomes and allow process to remain within, to, to allow process how you, how you receive or how you work towards those outcomes. The process should remain with the school itself. 
But what we want to see in a strong charter school law are what are the outcomes for the school. And these outcomes, again, are measured by these types of quality control provisions. Again, wholly lacking in your law. Um, and other immediate recommendations, and one of the reasons why your law scored so low <coughs> on the model charter school law is that your schools have relatively, uh, there's, they don't have a lot of autonomy. Your charter schools here are, do not receive many automatic exemptions from state rules and regulations. Um, teacher certification requirements are essentially the same as what we see in traditional public schools. There's not a lot of operational um, autonomy. And so what happens is if we want different outcomes, meaning higher outcomes for students, if we want unique schools and if we want schools that are different enough to help teach the traditional public schools of what's working, you need to give charter schools more autonomy. They need the, they need the growing room and they need the room to innovate. And your law does not allow for much um, uh, autonomy at all. So essentially what we see in Kansas is because of, because of your law, charter schools are actually bound by much of the same rules and regulations as traditional public schools. So we can't expect many different outcomes if the charter schools here look much the same as the traditional public schools. So again, um, an immediate recommendation for improving your law is to free your charter schools up and allow them, allow them the, the room to be innovative and to do things differently. And I want to say with number two, also with increased autonomy, allow them to fail. If a charter school is not performing over the term of its five-year contract, that school, really, that school should be closed. If you're going to tie a charter school to the same rules and regulation as the traditional public schools, essentially it becomes much more difficult to close them down because we're not treating them any different. So with increased autonomy, again, the charter school promises more autonomy for more accountability. If they don't have the autonomy, we're really not allowing those schools that should not remain open to close down. So again, very close relationship with number two and uh, the accountability features we want to see. And then third, um, your law should really do much more to allow for um, lots of good dialogue and questions and answers. Um, okay, this is probably the number one myth around charter schools. And I will be quite frank and say, I don't believe uh, school reformers and charter school supporters, I don't think we've done a very good job about educating the public. Um, that charter schools are indeed public schools. Um, Ten years later, we're still private schools, we're tuition, you know, on and on and on. Um, so again, I, I, think, I think it's one of the mistakes we have made in the last 10 years. Um, so here it is again. Charter schools must be open to all students. Your law actually, um, in studying your law in the last few days, actually does assure um, equitable access to enrollment for all students in the state. And so that's actually one of the strong features of your law, that you have no caps, you have room for growth, and that you really, your law really <coughs> has equitable access to entrance. Um, so again, one of, the strong, one of the strong features of your law. This is the other one that we hear all the time, charter schools cream the crop, char charter schools cherry pick their students, that we don't have to accept every student like the traditional public schools do. And again, simply not true. What we would wanna see with the strong charter school law, again, what you have in place here in Kansas, is that it is an open enrollment policy. And so again, one of the things we very much want to control through legislation is that there is access to enrollment um, no matter where a student lives. Um, charter schools cannot have admission requirements. They must be open to all students who want to attend. Um, what we see again, because of the high number of kids on a waiting list, I would venture to say 99, 98, 99% of charter schools across the country <coughs> enroll their students on a lottery basis. And that, that can vary state to state. Your law is very strong in the sense of having clear criteria for um, enrollment through the lottery, 
should more students want to attend this, this school than what there are seats. Again, um, we, we talked a little bit about this, is that what we also see with charter schools and going back to charter school performance is that more often than not, students who enroll in a charter school tend to be behind, uh, tend to be academically behind for lots of different reasons. Um, so again, as we talked about, the longer a, uh, a student is enrolled in a charter school, the, the better their performance uh, becomes over time. So the idea that we cherry pick our students simply isn't true because if we look at the data points that we saw in a few earlier slides, we see that we're actually serving higher percentages um, of kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, for example, low, um, higher percentages of ELL students, etc. Um, here's another myth, and I'm I'm sure that this never is heard in Kansas, right? That we take money away from the traditional public schools. Uh, this argument is very much alive and well throughout the country. I work in ten states, and uh, I hear it in ten states. Okay, that we take money away, that we're going to decimate the traditional public school system, that <laughs> on and on and on. Um, Eric mentioned this a little bit in his presentation. Um, essentially, what charter schools do is they move money from one school to another, um, as you all know. Um, the federal charter school program actually brings in millions of dollars to, to most states that have a robust charter school law. But I really think this goes back to the higher level um, debate of how do state policy makers feel about funding the child. <coughs> this just came up in New Mexico a few weeks ago in, in a presentation we made to the Education Committee. Um, essentially, I think Public, public policy makers need to understand, are we funding the child or are we funding school districts? So if our public taxpayer dollars are better served for that student and their family in a charter school, in a magnet school, in a virtual school, should that money truly follow the child or should it really stay within the district? And so again, I think there's, there's lots of things written about this, there's lots of public debate around this, that charter schools are taking money, but again, I think it has to come from how does the state, what is the state's um, position towards funding the child, and should the money truly, should the funding truly follow the student? This isn't easy. Um, it, it tends to be complex debate, it tends to be very controversial debate, um, but again, as charter schools become part, more part of the educational landscape, what I'm seeing across the country is that more public policy makers are, are really tackling this question in a very meaningful way. And again, how they answer this question would be reflected in the state's charter school law. And again, I think we talked a lot about this or enough about this. Charter schools are simply not accountable, that these are groups of parents who want to um, take their marbles and play in their own sandbox, so to speak, whatever the expression is. Again, charter schools are really infusing the traditional system with higher levels of, higher levels of accountability simply because they must prove their value to parents and to the taxpayers. And that value really comes down to are they delivering outcomes for kids. And I think this is the last one. We hear this a lot too, that charters actually undermine local control. Um, again, the charter school accountability model is from the bottom up. Charter schools are um, almost always started by teachers and parents and community leaders who really want to see a different kind of school in their community. So it actually takes the top down. The charter model is really not top down, but it, it is bottom up. And so they really, you know, in our opinion, are not undermining local control. What they really are doing is giving more control back to people in their community. The charter school model really is what we saw at schools in the late 1800s, early 19th century, that small community school run by community leaders. That is actually the charter school model before we um, 
before our public education system became industrialized, as we saw in the 20s and early 30s. <coughs> and that's all I have for, for now. Here's our website. Um, a lot of the, all of the studies, the model charter school law, the Kansas State ranking, can be found on our website, <coughs> publiccharters.org. I'm very much open to your questions and feedback. Here's my email, and I'm um, happy to to continue the dialogue, so thank you very much. Please use the microphone as you ask questions. Yes, hi. I have two questions. The yes. first one is, you have a model, your organization has a model uh, charter law from 2009. Yes. Does your model address the weaknesses in the Kansas, existing Kansas charter school law? What you would see is you go to the model charter school law, but right <coughs> under that it would be the state rankings report. So, so we looked at 41 states, including Kansas, right? To answer your question, yes. We looked at the 20 components. Is there caps? No. Your, there... your, your bill fixes it. Um, this publication would tell you where Kansas is doing well and where Kansas needs improvement, yes. Okay. So the answer is yes? The answer is yes. Okay. The second question is a bit more involved. Uh, starting a charter school takes a lot of cash, a lot of money. It's like starting a small business small restaurant, small retail store. Even if I gave you a free building and a truckload of free computers and books, you still have a big, you have to have a year's worth of cash to uh, handle utilities and salaries and all the applications and government documentation you have to go through. Question, are any states or private organizations helping charter schools with, with that first year uh, needed cash flow? Yes, and so the short answer is the federal government and um, I'm sure we have lots of opinions on the role of the federal government and the charter schools program and the Department of Innovation and Education. Um, if a state has a charter school law, the federal government actually kicks in money um, for startup funds. And so I don't know if that occurs in Kansas. My guess is it, it does. Most states with charter school law do receive federal funding. And so it allows for startup costs, uh, blackboards, gym equipment, um, contract services to get the school up and running, whatever it is. And then also I would imagine, again, I don't know the intricacies of your state finance law and how that looks for charter schools, but my guess would be once the school is operational that it receives its funds via its student enrollment. And so the ongoing costs associated with running a charter school would actually be covered by the public um, school funding formula. Make sense? Thanks. I'm happy to have a conversation afterwards, yes. You referred to a study uh, that uh, looked at charter schools and their performance, and then you also talked about how the states have different uh, caliber of charter school laws. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that study uh, concluded that the ones with the ideal law compared to those who had uh, laws that were poor in comparison to the way that you evaluated it. That's uh, one question. And secondly, on one of your um, later slides, it said something about the fact that uh, charter school students perform uh, at a level below their peers in the um, traditional public schools. Did, did that mean they started a level below or they performed poorly throughout the term? Um, we'll start with the latter part of the question. Um, make no mistake that in studies of charter school performance over the last few years, which again tend to be met the more method, methodolog method, methodologically more solid um, performance studies, it is a mixed bag for charter schools. Um, we see in some states and some jurisdictions that charter schools, charter schools are outperforming. We see in all too many charter schools are either performing the same, which in our opinion is not good enough to perform the same as traditional schools, or actually performing worse. So again, what we're seeing with the mixed bag for charter school performance is that we need to have more and deeper political will to simply close down those charter schools that are not performing well. How we evaluate charter school programs state by state, how we look at Closing down charter schools has everything to do with the state law, if that makes sense. And so what we would like to see in the state law that would make it easier to close down schools for non-performance, whether fiscal or academic, 
is we would want to see more of those quality control provisions. We, we would want to see clear processes for approving charters, clear objective processes for renewing charter schools. We would want to see very robust uh, charter school contracts between the charter school and its authorizer. We would want to make sure that charter school has as much autonomy as possible to be nimble enough to fix problems as they come up. So again, it has everything. Performance is absolutely a result of the strength of the charter school law. Missing some of those very important components, what we see in states uh, is that charter schools are performing the same. Again, not good enough in our opinion, or in fact worse. Does that help clarify it? Well, I, I wanted to know how we, we rank rather poorly in, in, in your comparison. Yes. So how, how did, as far as the, the way the law is drafted, so how are our charter schools comparing against those who rank very highly? What do those statistics look like? Do you have, I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't have the answer to that question and how your charter schools are performing here in the state of Kansas. I can ask, I guess I'll follow up with a question. In your charter school law, is there a provision for periodic evaluation of the state's charter school program? Again, an important characteristic of, of a strong charter school law is, are we periodically evaluating charter school performance? Without that type of objective data collection and analysis, and it is missing in your law, then we really don't have the answer to that question, which again would point to a state's relatively low ranking as compared to the model charter school law. Well, do we have in any of the, the states that rank at the top, do we yes. see, so how do they compare to their, their peers in the traditional schools? Um, states where we see charter schools outperforming their traditional public school counterparts would be states like Minnesota. Uh, District of Columbia is actually starting to really make strides at very robust charter schools program. Um, so we're seeing the DC public, DC public charter schools beginning to outperform. Um, Georgia charter schools, New Jersey charter schools outperform. Um, Idaho public charter schools are outperforming their traditional schools. Again, that would, uh, that would be the responsibility of the state to periodically evaluate charter school performance. So I don't, have the, I don't have the answer to how charter schools are performing here in Kansas. Does, does your state do periodic evaluation of charter school performance at all, or has it in the last three to five years? Does anyone know that? I would venture to say if we don't know how schools are performing through a very, you know, solid, data-based, data-driven performance report, it would, I would venture to say it would be challenging for state policymakers to really enact a lots of improvements or assure equitable funding because the answer will come, the answer will emerge, well, how are they doing? Does that make sense? I can tell you in New Mexico, again, just the state I've worked most closely in, uh, we, we enacted a significant improvement to our law this year that we really beefed up our charter school contract requirements. The reason we did that is in New Mexico, our charter schools were not performing well at all. Half of them were performing at the same rate as the traditional public schools. How that played out legislatively is policymakers were saying, well, wait a minute, why should we give, why should we make any improvements to our law if our charter schools aren't delivering if they're essentially acting the same as our traditional public schools, which by the way, we're about 49th in the country. Um, so again, I would add to the immediate recommendation here in Kansas is to either through a private foundation um, or perhaps a state-sponsored study, which again opens up a whole other, um, anyway to commission a study on what performance looks like here in Kansas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. To get a baseline, let's presume that a state uh, enacts your recommended law mm -hmm. for charter schools. Mm -hmm. If it did, how would those charter schools be different than the traditional public school? Uh, and also, how would it be different from a private school, to put it in the parlance of this meeting, right. compare and contrast uh, 
uh, charter school, a public school, compare and try, contrast a charter school with a private school. So let's look at a public charter school versus a public traditional school. First and foremost, it would be that idea of a charter contract. The most salient characteristic of charter schools is a five-year contract. Every five years, they go up for renewal, and the renewal would be based on the outcomes they are delivering for students. So if we see at the time of renewal, after five years, a charter school's graduation rate, say it's a high school, is lower than your state average, I would question whether or not that school should stay open. If a charter school's achievement gap is the same or worse than your state average, <coughs> I would suggest that that charter school need to close. So again, it's the charter schools have, at their very best, a charter school law and a charter school has a laser-like focus on outcomes. And that would be the criteria for allowing, so to speak, a charter school to stay open. Very different model than a traditional public school. Comparison is the autonomy. Charter schools are governed by their own board of directors. They are allowed to make their own budgeting decisions, their hiring and firing decisions. If they are granted autonomy through a charter school law, they, they, they have 100% authority over any decisions how to run the school. Very different than a traditional school which has to go through the local superintendent and the local school board. If a school wants to change its curriculum, what we see, teachers say, hey, this math curriculum's not working, we're not getting the outcomes. Well, if the school's lucky after going through the bureaucratic sort of overlay, they may be able to change that in a year. A charter school would be able to change that with its own site-based governance in one meeting. So again, much less bureaucracy in a, in a charter school. And I'll end here because I'm getting the sign. Compared to, it's my boss here, compared to a private school, charter schools have to adhere to um, many of the state's laws and regulations around special education, Title I funding, open enrollment. Charter schools are not allowed to have admission requirements. And so again, charter schools are public schools. And while we want to see a high level of autonomy and waivers from lots of the rules and regulations around traditional public schools, at their very essence, they are public schools. And so we have obligations to ensure that all students attending charter schools are given um, equal, uh, equal treatment and access under the law. So that's in a nutshell. Thank you very much. I'll be here for the rest of the day and, and here for any more of your questions. And I appreciate your attention very much. Thank you.